Welcome to this week's episode of Insight. During this week's show, we're going to cover two primary topics. The first one is going to be some new developments on the IT front, uh, uh, in sp specifically having to do with the establishment of the data center. And then we're going to move into, say, a few words about the return visit of Armenian civil society to Baku. It was announced about 10 days ago that Firebird, which is the big data center being built in Armenia, got all the specific export licenses and waivers necessary from the United States, uh, from this has to do with microchips or supercomputers, to begin the construction of this project. Uh, this was literally the last obstacle to the construction, to the start of the construction. It was also announced that Dell, which is a, one of the biggest IT companies in the world, that's out of the United States actually, uh, will be joining this project as a partner. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was a very historic visit by uh, Narek Mukherjian, who's the Armenian ambassador uh, to the United States, to Silicon Valley, where he spent two days actually meeting with uh, the leadership in NVIDIA, Apple, Google, Synopsis, and AMD, OpenAI, and many other leading uh, companies. Almost all of these companies are essentially the future leaders, not only in in advanced semiconductors, but most, um, and more importantly, in AI, specifically frontier AI. Uh, normally, these kinds of trips by ambassadors, frankly, are more decorative than not. They have more to do with publicity than not. But in this case, this is actually far more serious. This is exactly one of the side benefits of the August 8th agreement, no matter what anybody thinks of whatever came of the road or whatever. And part of the side agreements, essentially, it's going to lead to the full integration of our IT sector uh, with the U.S. IT sector, which is obviously the dominant one in the world. This will lead to FDI, which is foreign direct investment on the IT sector in Armenia. Uh, the reality is in today's world, the IT business is extremely political. It's essentially, there's really no distinction between state and industry, especially when it comes to control and management of social media. It's obvious that uh, American companies have gotten a signal from the U.S. government to fully engage with Armenia at this point. This starts with actually having access to very specific products that other people and other countries do not have access to. Uh, then that leads to having access to the U.S. market, which is the most important IT market in the world. So in a way, the ambassadors visited actually a weaponization of all this process. Uh, let's try to understand this and analyze this. You know, uh, when we look back at it 20 years from now, uh, this might actually be far more relevant and important than almost any other developments today uh, for a simple reason. Uh, a rich Armenia is a secure Armenia uh, in having obviously the terms to defend itself. Uh, more importantly, or as importantly, uh, the US or major corporate footprints in Armenia as it grows is also very much a national security matter. And it's something that if you raise the value of the country, the country becomes far less vulnerable. Uh, and it actually, in a way, goes way beyond that because uh, the world is sort of dividing up. You know, over the next 20 years, you're either going to be in the leading edge of AI innovation, where we're obviously heading with these kinds of developments, or your second option is to be join the garbage heap of history. Those are the two options. The future is not in pipelines, highways, or being a transit country for other people's goods. It's actually being a central part of the 21st century economy. That will define state capacity on all fronts, from defense to economic development, which is the key indicator of a success or a failure of any country. On November 21st, five Armenian think tankers, human rights advocates, and future wannabe ambassadors to Baku went to uh, flew to that country, to the capital of that country, to hold meetings with their non-existent uh, civil society sector. Uh, in fact, they actually met mostly with regime functionaries, including the head regime functionary himself, a man known as Baku Goebbels, Hikmat Hajayev. When our innocents abroad eventually returned to Yerevan, they held a press conference in which they passed on a message of peace from Hikmat Hajayev himself to the Armenian people. The following was the general public reaction. In fairness to Mr. Hajayev, however, his message of peace was actually believed 
by many children, fools, and certain academics. Uh, our visitors to Baku also went on to say that uh, they actually brought up the issue of our hostages being held in Baku, and they were listened to, according to them. Who could ever doubt that? What I want to do at this point is let's move on to a small portion of their press conference so you get a glimpse of what was being discussed. When they talk on the phone, when they pick up the call and say, Hey, brat, you think at that moment there are Armenians next to you because there are so many similarities in that regard that it's even surprising. That was Arek Kochinyan. If being gullible was any kind of a blessing, he would be a saint. In analyzing all this, you know, I've made my position about these kinds of meetings very clear in the past, so I'm not going to go over it again. Uh, I'm just going to continue by asking our participants, our five participants, a few questions. The first one is, how did you feel sleeping in your fancy Baku hotel rooms, knowing that at the same time, Vikan Uljekyan, which is an illegally held Armenian prisoner in Baku since 2020, has been tortured to a point that he can no longer walk, uh, and he's been paralyzed, except he's not provided with a wheelchair in his prison. Uh, did you ever think that the people paying for your fancy dinners and caviar in Baku are the same people who murdered Never and Mikhail Khazaryan on September 13th in Tsarnakhpur village? I'm sure you'll respond by saying, come on, this is demagoguery and we need to move on and work towards peace. Fair point. But if so, how do you explain the following? <laughs> That was a recent video from an Azeri public school of a role-playing session on how to torture and beat Armenian children. I bet you never brought this up in your meetings in Baku. I will close by reading a passage from French philosopher Albert Camus' Notebooks, Chapter 3, something that I read in my student years. Their only excuse lies in this terrible era. Finally, something in them ultimately aspires to servitude. They dreamt of going there by some noble pathway, full of thoughts. But there is no royal path to servitude. Thank you for joining me in this week's episode of Insights. You wonder why they call you bitch. 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 Look here, Miss Thing. Hate to salt your game, but you's a money hungry woman and you need to change. In the locker room, all the homies do is laugh, high fives, cause another nigga played your ass. It was said you were sleazy, even easy, sleeping around for what you need to see. It's your thing, and you can shake it how you wanna. Give it up free or make your money on the corner, but don't be bad. Play the game, get mad and change. Then you wonder why these motherfuckers call your name. Still looking for a way out, and that's okay. I can see you want to stray. There's a way out. Keep your mind on your money and roll in school. And as the years pass by, you can show them fools. But you ain't trying to hear me because you're stuck. You're heading for the bathroom, about to get tossed up.